Hi, everybody. Welcome to the Flawed Theology Podcast. I'm Phil. And I'm Susie. And we're asking the question, if your theology were wrong, wouldn't you want to know? Today, our guest uh, is a friend of mine named Alex, and he is actually a former Mormon. And this is kind of a unique um, a unique guest because, you know, for the majority of our podcast, we always talk about mostly evangelical Christianity and Lutheran Christianity and kind of American Christianity. So we are going to dig into Mormonism a little bit, which is, I find Mormonism fascinating. It really uh, yeah. is. <laughs> so I think it's going to be a really fun discussion. We've been looking forward to this for a while. So welcome to the show, Alex. Oh, thank you very much, guys. So Alex is across the pond in the nether. Netherlands. Um, he's early evening, I guess, over there. So yeah, yeah, it's early evening over here. Yeah. So we appreciate you taking some time out with us, but tell us a little bit about your kind of general personal background. I am the eldest of four kids and I uh, grew up over here in the Netherlands. I was actually born in the States. Oh, really? I born in the, yeah, I was born in Provo, Utah. My dad lived there while uh, he met my mom, but both my parents are Dutch. But uh, after about when I was about a year old, my parents moved back to the Netherlands uh, because my father, had gotten a job with the church. Uh, whenever I refer to the church, I, ref- uh, I mean the Mormon church, uh, which they might be very offended by because currently it's a trend that you're not allowed to call it the Mormon church. Oh, really? What are you supposed to call it? Well, they're trying to rebrand. So they want you to use the official name of the church, which is the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Okay. Which is a whole mouthful. Yeah. <laughs> which is why nobody says that. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so at best, people tend to use the name Latter-day Saints. Just a lot easier. Yeah. Uh, my father got a job here as the seminary coordinator. And that means a seminary institute are programs for young people to study scripture and study like Mormon theology. It's very brainwashy, especially seminary. Seminary is early morning study, and uh, you do it either at home or in, uh, for instance, if you have a group big enough, you do it in a classroom. Uh, But it's usually before school. So you get that teenage brain from 14 years old, (laughs) and you uh, start drilling into them when they're not quite awake. Everything (laughs) Everything that they're supposed to know. That's interesting that seminary is like so young in Mormonism, whereas like seminary here would be like post-college or like that's like a graduate level thing. But Mormonism seminary starts in the teen years. That's interesting. Yeah. And it runs for four years. Wow. And that's during your high school years, like what in America would be high school years, 14 to 18? 14 to 18. Okay. And that's before school. And what kind of school did you go to? Something public, like um, secular? Well, I live in the Netherlands and there's virtually no religious schooling here. Okay. Virtually everything is uh, secular. Even the schools that are religious, most of them are mostly secular. So if you go to a Catholic school, School here, it means that at best you'll get an explanation of all the um, Catholic practices, but you're not required to be a Catholic. You're not required mm-hmm. to actually attend right. Mass. You're not required to uh, take sacrament there. Oh, interesting. Uh, there's some exceptions. The, uh, the biggest exceptions in that are Muslim schools, Islamic schools. Mm-hmm. They tend to lean a bit more heavy on the uh, religion, but most schools are very, very secular. Uh, I went to a public school. I went to a non-secular school as well, but my brother went to a Catholic high school, but he he didn't really notice. <laughs> he didn't notice. <laughs> There's not a lot of religion. Like the the Catholic aspect of it was not noticeable. Wow. Interesting. It's very different from here. Yeah, that's yeah. interesting. I mean, there are some Catholic schools here where you don't have to be Catholic to go to, but they still, you know, make you mm-hmm. do catechism and do all of that kind of stuff. So right. I've always felt, especially post deconversion, that Catholics are actually less into the indoctrination than evangelical Christianity. They're like, there's yeah. a lot of Catholics that just go to mass on Saturday and couldn't give a shit about Catholicism the rest of the week. So <laughs> I, I live in a Catholic part of the country, but most of the people I know are not even too sure whether they're really Catholic. <laughs> that's interesting. They're like, well, I think I was baptized when I was a baby, and that's about it. Right, right. Wow. <laughs> so they have an actual separation of church and state, not a <laughs> fake one like we have here. Uh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> the fake one I'm not going to comment on because they might crucify me online, but <laughs> yeah. uh, but uh, over here, uh, separation of church and state is very much a thing. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Even even in politics, we, uh, we have a lot more political parties than they do in the states, mm. but like I think there's there's like 13 or 14 in government right now. Uh, but I think maybe three of those are slightly religious based. Oh, interesting. And, and they don't lean too heavily on the religion part because they know it will cost them voters. Right, right. Mm. Yeah, so that is interesting. It is, it is a bit different. 
Uh, but I did grow up in a very religious thing. In fact, it was my dad's job, and it's still my dad's job. He's he's nearing retirement age now. But um, his job was to organize, uh, like I said, seminary and institute. An institute is for college aged people, uh, but it's similar. It's classes on theology or scripture study or church history or uh, marriage improvement classes or mission prepar- preparation classes or uh, all sorts of subjects there. Yeah. And so his job was to teach the teachers and uh, arrange things like the books for it and uh, organize the classes and just everything to do with that. So he he would travel all over the Netherlands and Belgium, which sounds like a lot, but like I can drive from one end of the country to the other in like two and a half hours. So it's not, <laughs> it's not as bad as it sounds. Yeah, yeah. So this seminary and what did you call the other one? The Institute? Yeah. Is that something that happens here in America with Mormonism yes. too? Okay. Yes. And depending on where you live, seminary can be part of school. Okay. okay. So in the Mormon heavy areas where there's a large Mormon population in high schools, uh, there will actually be an early seminary class that kids can attend before class starts. Okay. Wow. And But for me, because I live in a very low percentage Mormon mm-hmm. uh, country place, the nearest kid who did seminary is like 40 miles away. <laughs> wow. <laughs> so we didn't really share classes. Yeah. Uh, so my teachers were first my mom and then my dad. And we would do that early in the mornings when I was 14. And then later my younger brother joined as well. Do you know about what percent of the Netherlands population is Mormon? When I think of Mormon, I don't think of the Netherlands. <laughs> no, no, it's very tiny. I think on paper, there's maybe 3,000 members, and we are a country of 17 million people. Okay, that's very sure, small. Yeah. Very, so small. Very, very small percentage. Very low. Yeah, uh, most of the bigger cities will have a Mormon church in it, but currently attendance has been dropping enough that it, like it, most of the time there's under 100 people there. Yeah. They're experiencing a decline in the Mormon population in the Netherlands? A very, very well, all over the world, really. Uh, okay. uh, the internet is killing the Mormon church. <laughs> Yay. So, just like it's killing a lot of yeah. denominations and religion. Yeah. yeah. That's interesting. So when your parents were in Provo, did they go there because of Mormonism as well? Is that how they landed there? Yes and no. Uh, my grandparent, my my grandfather... My grandfather, I think he uh, he got a job job with BYU in uh, in Utah at some point, uh, which is why they moved to Utah. And my father studied at Brigham Young University at the time. Okay, hmm. which BYU and Provo and that area, just so people know, Salt Lake City, that's Mormon heaven, you know, as far as modern yes. Mormonism goes. That's Mormon Central. Yep. Yeah, Mormon Central. My in laws actually lived in Provo for a while because my father in law worked for a government contractor, and it, he was sent out there to work and he tells some pretty interesting stories about you know that being a dry town and <laughs> and the influence of mormonism on the whole town as a non-mormon so it's, that's pretty interesting like it's yeah. it's almost like a, a little mormon oasis well, and in that's the desert. even more true for a place like byu where the religious requirements are very much tied to the scholastic requirements right like if you go into byu being a member of the church and you want to leave the church you will also get kicked out of school mm-hmm. oh, okay They're very tied together. Yeah. And for a lot of people at the moment, for like the current generation, uh, they're having a very rough time because that's usually the time they find out they don't want to be in the church anymore. So they have (laughs) to continue pretending to stay in the church while they're still going to school to the point that recently uh, at a graduation speech, one of the closing speakers even said, "Uh, I know a lot of you are waiting to leave the church, to Mm -hmm. leave school so you can leave the church, but please don't. (laughs) Wow. That's crazy. I mean, I went to like an evangelical college myself. So I I understand that kind of thing where in order to go to the school, you had to give like a profession of faith and tell them, you know, and you had to follow a code of conduct. There was, you know, a percentage of people there that obviously maybe lied or weren't strong, you know, on fire for God Christians. But the by and large, the majority of people that were there when I was there, you know, were fully indoctrinated like I was. So that just seems like, um, like a mind prison. Oh, definitely. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. It, It honestly, I don't know if I'd be able to do it. Like I'm, the the people, we even have a term for people who uh, who stay in the church despite not believing. On the online, there's an abbreviation for it. They're called PIMO. 
which means physically in, mentally out. <laughs> oh, yeah. I've, uh, I've seen that before. And uh, there's a lot of people who are experiencing that uh, simply because they are very afraid and often with reason that they'll lose family connections, they'll lose their marriage, they'll lose their kids and it's or their jobs even. Yeah. Uh, so there's there's a lot of people uh, uh, I see who confess to pretending to be in and that can be harsh. Yeah. I have so many questions, but maybe we should get back to your story. <laughs> so my dad and my mom moved here while I was very small. My father was the uh, CES coordinator, which means that CES is the church education system. There's a lot of terms and abbreviations that I don't want to spend too much time on. <laughs> yeah, it's educational. So yeah, CES is the church education system. They are officially not a part of the clergy, but they do all the organizational stuff for seminary and institute. And so my dad for a long time was the only paid member in the country. Hmm. Most of the Mormon clergy are not paid. Really? They do not get paid, period. This makes so much sense now. I have a friend who's a dentist and he's also, I just found out he's like a bishop or something. Is that the right, right. term? Bishop yeah, in the Mormon good, church. And term. I'm like, yeah. I don't understand how he's a dentist. Like, okay, it's that a, makes so yeah. much sense. It's a full-time job next to his job. Wow. There's a lot of work that goes into being a Mormon bishop and they don't get a penny. Wow. How many hours a week do you think my dentist friend spends being a bishop? Probably anywhere between 10 to 20 hours a week. Holy crap. There's a phrase that the uh, the church likes to use when they, they say the clergy isn't paid, like all the clergy are volunteers. It's not entirely true, but on a local level, that's true. So all the local bishops, all the local, what we call stake presidents who are like the, it's like a bishop for a larger region, mm -hmm. uh, they're all not paid. Uh, it's up until you get to a certain point in the church, and this is something I only found out like in the last year and a half, uh, then you start getting paid and you okay. get paid well. Like it's not millions, but it's <laughs> enough that you never have to worry about anything again. Kind of sounds like a pyramid scheme. Yeah. <laughs> it's very much similar to a pyramid scheme. Uh, and there's a lot that goes into that as well. But for the longest time to get back, uh, my father was the, the only paid member of the church in the country. Uh, and he spent a lot of time on that because he saw it as his calling as well as his job. So I think the average amount of hours my father made in a week for the church, anywhere in between 60 and 80. So he was he was going hard. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and he was lucky in that a lot of his work he could do from home. So he had, he had a home office, so we got to see him a lot. But in the evenings, he was away a lot. Uh, we were also constantly disturbed by the phone. <laughs> <laughs> um, because of this, because of his job, he is kind of like a local celebrity in the Mormon church. Like there's people who will quote him sometimes almost in the same way that they will quote the prophet of the church. Wow. So I, like I grew up going everywhere and meeting everyone in the country. I I've been to every like ward building I've met, at least during that time, I've met like 70% of all the members here and was on first name basis with a lot of them. Wow. It was interesting. It was really fun too, because I'd come home after school and my dad would go, well, I have to go to a, uh, an institute day or teach a class somewhere. Do you want to come along? And I'd be like, all right. And we'd leave and I wouldn't come home with him until later. And we'd grab a McDonald's on the way back or something and we'd just have a fun time. So I got to spend a lot of really quality, quality time with my dad because of that. But he was also away from home a lot because of that. Mm -hmm. So at this point, were you totally 100% indoctrinated, bought into the theology, hook, line, sinker, no doubts? Up until about two and a half years ago. Wow. Okay. I am very fresh out. <laughs> yeah, you're you're yeah. new. Would you say that your experience as a child and, and up to the point where you were thinking about leaving was, was positive? I experienced most of it as positive, and I've recently begun to recognize a lot of the trauma. Mm. My way of thinking, like sometimes I'm like, oh, wait, that's why my personality screwed up in this way. <laughs> oh, that makes perfect sense. That's what they <laughs> that teach explains the it. <laughs> right, right. Like the way I grew up with money and not feeling like I could ever spend anything on myself. Well, that makes sense because there was never enough money because we had four kids. Uh, my dad was the only one with a salary and we paid tithing and a lot mm. of money went into tithing. Right. And tithing is 10%? Tithing is hard 10%. Yeah, like it's mandated. Yeah. And so they know what your income is? Do you have to provide income statements? Well, they do not. But if you lie about it, then you go it's, to hell. So it's like an yeah. Ananias and Sapphira type situation. Uh, well, <laughs> plus, yeah. your, plus your dad worked for the church, so they would know what he made. Oh, uh, they'd know what yeah, he made. Yeah, they'd know but, uh, for him. But the bishop that he paid tithing to wouldn't know. Right. So uh, tithing is paid directly to the ward that you're in. Like every ward has a bank account. Mm-hmm. And so it's paid into the work. I got to see a lot of this because I was also the 
financial secretary for a number of years. Oh, nice. <laughs> uh, so it's I know what like... everyone's paying and tithing in this ward. Yeah, uh, no, nothing like seeing behind the curtain there. Yep. I know what they either make or say they're making. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, tithing is uh, uh, officially the bishop can't d- dictate what tith- how, man- how much tithing it is. All, the requirement is you have to pay an honest tithing and mm-hmm. you you personally decide what's an honest tithing. So some people pay it over their gross income, some pay it over their net. Some people rarely, we did this last few years before we left, but some people will deduct like their living expenses mm. and then pay over that. Other people would just pay an, a small amount. We we have a friend, for instance, who doesn't have a job and she's a member of the church, but her husband isn't. Uh, and he won't allow her to pay tithing because she doesn't mm. make any money. Mm. But but tithing is a like a, is a hard hard requirement. But that's yeah. so interesting to me. Now that I know that they're not paid, that the clergy is not paid, where does the money go? Like the uh, it, it that's can a only, good question. Yeah, yeah. Talk about Into that. the dragon's hoard of the church. <laughs> oh, that's why the, the Mormon temples are so big. I'm not yeah. kidding. recently the church got a fine of I think five million dollars mm-hmm. for hiding its money for hiding thirty billion dollars of its money into too many. Tri- uh, uh, shell companies. Hello. Yeah, I do remember seeing that. Uh, that was a small portion of their holdings, mm. a tiny portion of their holdings. That's so scary. Uh, a couple of years back came out that the, I forget the name of the uh, management company now, but Salt Lake has its own asset fund management company. Uh, a couple of years back it came out that they have a $100 billion account of stock and holding. Wow. <laughs> That's the money they're not using. Yeah. They furthermore are the second largest landholder in Florida. And and really? they have cattle ranches all over the country. They own hotels. They own malls. They own... Uh, I recently found out they own a Raytheon building, <laughs> which was fun. That's what? a nice U.S. government contractor, by the way, in case you... Uh, that. yeah, that's a defense contractor. A defense contractor. Who make fun things like the... I think it's the RX-9 knife missile. They make some good, some interesting non-Christian things. <laughs> I, do, I do not understand this. Why aren't they using any of that money to, I don't know, solve world hunger? Well, they could, but that's not the goal. That's a yeah. huge amount of money. Well, and, and that amount was, I think, almost 10 years ago now. It's estimated that it's close to $200 billion mm. now. Yeah, of yeah. course. And that's very similar to like what Scientology does with real estate in Florida investing and they're just Clearwater, like buy yeah. properties and they that's so it's a similar kind of thing you can hide your money in real estate and... yep. it, it sounds like Mormonism is much bigger oh it sounds way bigger uh, when <laughs> it comes to money Mormonism is bigger than Scientology yeah mm-hmm. they well, and have, and members uh, this has been well they've, this has been going on since I think the 40s or late or mid 50s I think uh the church has for a long time has always had trouble making enough money. And then somewhere in, I think, mid last century, one of the prophets came out and said, well, from now on, paying tithing is a requirement for you to go to the temple and everyone has to pay full tithing. Uh, And you know what? When we're finally out of financial trouble, at some point, we'll have enough money that no one has to pay tithing again. (laughs) That's what he said. Uh, That moment was probably 50 years ago. (laughs) Yeah. Uh, They've been hoarding it up ever since. He never got that secondary revelation. Well, he was dead before the (laughs) Before you could say, well, that's enough. But uh, uh, they're all old men. So they, you know, they tend to die before the fruition of their prophecy. If you could like sum up Mormonism, Mormon theology, what are kind of the basic tenets of Mormon theology if you were explaining it to someone who had never heard of it? Yeah. I always explain, because I was on a mission, and we'll probably get into that later, but I, um, we, I, I, was, a, I, was, a, <laughs> I was a salesman for Mormonism for at least two years of my life. <laughs> I always summed up the difference between regular Christianity and Mormonism. M- Mormons would argue they're also Christians, by the way. Right. But uh, I always summed it up as Mormons very strongly believe in continuing revelation, meaning God never stopped talking to people, most specifically the prophet. Uh, and that means that constant changes can be the result of revelation and Mormonisms w- Mormons would say uh, the world now is different from the world 2000 years ago so we need modern instruction for a modern time mm. so is that their excuse that they use when revelations change or contradict each other Very. is that they oh it's because it's a changing times and so things are being updated by God that, that is the excuse they try to use but a lot of times the things that contradict each other uh, contradict each other on a 
fundamental level, which makes uh-huh. it very difficult. Like if you look at it critically, it makes no sense. Yeah. Uh, an example of that is I, I said earlier, they don't like to be called Mormons. Uh, under the previous prophet, they did like to be called Mormons. <laughs> okay. <laughs> And there's always one prophet, sort of like a president? There's always one prophet, there's always 12 apostles, and there's always two counselors to the prophet. Okay. So there's 15 in total who are at the very tippy top of the the pyramid. So the prophet's kind of like the pope? Yeah, more or less. And how's the prophet chosen? Oh, we have have a fun joke about that. Um, (laughs) Catholics believe the prophet, uh, Catholics believe the pope is perfect, but no one believes it. And Mormons (laughs) believe that the uh, prophet is flawed, but no one believes it. (laughs) Uh, The prophet is chosen. He's usually the most senior apostle when the prophet dies. Officially, it's a revelation process, and they're all like supposed to all anonymously vote on who becomes the next prophet. But this has happened so many times in exactly the same way that like everyone's like, oh, he's going to be the next prophet. (laughs) Okay. Because you can just count seniority in the the quorum of apostles and just go, oh, he's obviously next in line. And it happens every time. Okay. But the the whole like revelation thing uh, also makes for a any excuse when something happens that you didn't account for earlier. Yeah, I don't know if you were. I don't know if you ever watched this. Yes, I think we talked about it, but they they came out with a show here called Under Under the Banner of Heaven that was a a reenactment of things that actually happened in Mormon history. And I know one of the things that happens in that re, in that fictional story is you know the prophet decides that polygamy polygamy needs to be a thing again because it wasn't at the time and the setting of this thing. And so he just did the thing of saying, well, I got a new revelation from God. He put it out to the community. And of course, some people were like, well, that's convenient that he came up with that because he wanted to have all these wives, but nobody questioned it because that's how it worked. You know, they were used to getting that continuing revelation. And so when it, basically whenever the prophet wants to change something, he can say, I got a new revelation and who's, who's going to challenge him, right? <laughs> That series is actually about one of the more fundamentalist branches of Mormonism. Uh, Mormonism isn't a completely solid block, uh, but there's not a lot of branch. But that's that series is about one of those. I still have to watch that series. Like we, me and my wife have been wondering whether we should go through that trauma of watching that because there's a lot of accuracy in that series uh-huh. as well. Uh, yeah. But if you're at all interested in Mormonism, it might be a fun watch. Uh, but but that that whole thing, the whole revelation thing, makes almost anything possible. It's the thing that accounts for the. Book of Mormon. It's the thing that accounts for other scripture that they have. It allows them to say, uh, well, whenever we have general conference, that's a twice a year thing, uh, everything the prophet says at that general conference is scripture. So they're continually making new scripture. Yes. Does that mean that somebody actually writes it down and publishes it? Everything. Okay. Every word. So they write all that stuff down and then do they publish like say an addendum to the Book of Mormon saying this is this year's revelation? No, not quite like that. Uh, There's a a church magazine called the Enzyme. Wait, Uh, sorry, what is it called? The Enzyme. Enzyme? Yes. Uh, It's from a Brigham Young quote of uh, uh, I think or Joseph Smith quote of uh, let this place be an Enzyme to the nations. type. What does that mean? A banner standard, a place to come to to an example, a shining city on the hill, uh, that kind of thing. Did they make up that word? I've never heard it. No, no, Ensign is in the E-N-S-I-G-N? Uh, E-N-S-I-G-N, yeah. So oh. that's, which is also like an ensign in the Navy, which is like the lowest level of okay. like rank that you can get. But it's the highest. They it's might a real... have reappropriated it. Yes. <laughs> yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. Uh, well, that's interesting. <laughs> there's, a, there's a lot of that. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, but, but it allows them to make everything revelation. So you can continually come up with new things. Like, for instance, um, Gordon B. Hinckley, uh, two prophets ago, uh, came out at some point and made the statement that uh, uh, women should not have more than one pair of earrings. That's not going to work for me. <laughs> well, it's not going to work for anybody. It didn't work for my wife either, but she still <laughs> did it. Uh, she, uh, she, she always wanted more th- than one piercing in her ear, but she never got one because the prophet had said you can only have one pair. Of uh, one pair. Wait, do you mean one pair of earrings one pair. or one piercing? One piercing. No, no. One per ear. So okay. one pair. Yeah. But you can't ever change that pair? Like I can't change it out to no, a No, no, you can. You just can't have any oh, extra okay. whole shot. You can't have I, I extra didn't understand. piercings. Yeah, you can't actually. have okay. more more than one piercing piercing in each ear. Got uh, it. Yeah. I still would fail that. <laughs> and you can't have nose piercings, and you can't have lip piercings, and tattoos are definitely right. not done. Certain clothing styles were not okay, and certain clothing articles were not okay. And there's a whole list of this. And uh, there's a lot of women who were in the audience when he gave that talk who on the spot took out their second pair of piercings. <gasps> 
They're so brainwashed. <laughs> I mean, to me, that I would walk out. I'd be like, no, this is bullshit. Final day on the coffin, I'm leaving. But these women are so brainwashed that they blindly obey this nonsensical edict. Yep. And, and this was, I suspect, mostly based on his personal taste. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But it was brought as revelation and we're supposed to represent the Lord. And in the scriptures, in Isaiah, it speaks about tingling earrings and bracelets and <laughs> all sorts of things. And we, we can't have that. So, uh, well, we can't tell the women to not have any earrings. So we, at least we'll, we'll tell them they can have only one pair yeah. <laughs> in, in their ears at one point. Uh, but the men definitely can't Horrible. have their ear pe ears pierced. Yeah. This is the point of devotion and belief that there is. And like you said, brainwashing, because it's, it's very much a, a brainwashed state. Yeah. So in the Mormon theology, like, I don't know if even Mormons use this term, but is there salvation and how do you get salvation? Well, Mormonism takes very much the uh, the scripture that says that faith without works is dead to heart, which means, yes, there is uh, there is redemption and there is, um, I can't think of the word, I haven't spoken Mormon English for so long, <laughs> I can't think of some of the terms now. <laughs> But there's, there's redemption based on forgiveness and based on uh, grace, but you have to earn grace. Mm -hmm. So you can never make up for all the sins you have done, you've committed, but you have to show to Christ that you're fully committed. Uh -huh. And then he will be forgiving and say, well, in that case, you've done enough and you, you can enter the kingdom. Uh, and there's a lot of, there's a lot of requirements. Uh, baptism is one. Mormons baptize at eight years, at eight years old at the youngest. Um, for the men, they will need to have the priesthood, uh, which you can get from as an early age as 12 years old. I was a deacon at 12 years old. I was a, a, a teacher at 14 and a priest at 16. And at the ripe old age of, uh, <laughs> ripe old age of 18, I was an elder in the church. <laughs> and so is that why when they go on mission, you'll see them with the name tags and it's elder yeah. so and so. So, so that's like a ranking. It's like a priesthood office. Okay. I am also a certified high priest. I don't know if you knew this, but. <laughs> Congratulations. Congratulations. You can tell you people you talk to a high priest today. Maybe we're going <laughs> to actually, can we change the name of the episode maybe to the one with the high priest? Of <laughs> that the one. would be that, cool. That's, that's the one okay. with the one with Alex, that'd be awesome. Uh, so that's interesting because that is a different kind of approach to salvation than traditional Christianity, where their big thing is salvation is a free gift. Right. But then they tell you that the works happen afterwards. But salvation itself is free. Mormonism doesn't really pull any punches. They're saying- no. This shit's not free. You're going to work your ass off for it. And if you don't, now, do they also believe if you don't work your ass off for it, you're out and the, and God can still send you to hell or you once a Mormon, always a Mormon? It's slightly less harsh than that. Mormons believe in a multi-tiered afterlife. Here we go. Mm. Uh, so uh, at the very top, there is the celestial kingdom. Uh, they uh, pull this from uh, uh, where Paul speaks about multiple degrees of heaven. When he speaks of one is like the moon and one is like the sun and one is like the stars. Mm -hmm. uh, and they say, well, the celestial kingdom is like the sun. It's the highest thing. It's the most light. It's where you live with God. And even within that kingdom, there's multiple tiers, at least three that we know of from Joseph Smith. That's for the believing Mormons who did everything they could and mm. who did all their covenants and all their temple stuff and who got married. Yes, it is a requirement to be married in the temple to be able to reach the highest degree of uh, glory. That's the top one. Then after that comes the terrestrial kingdom, which is like Earth, but better. <laughs> this is where all the good people go that didn't make all the church choice. So, uh, Phil, uh, we might meet there if, if there's yeah. anything going <laughs> okay, on. Okay, interesting. <laughs> so you don't have to be a Mormon to be in the terrestrial kingdom thing? No, no. You don't have to be a Mormon. To be, you just have to be a good person. Hmm. That's very interesting. There are even the people who, because Mormon believe in afterlife preaching as well, uh, there are even for people who come to the afterlife, get the gospel as Mormons see it, and say, well, this is not quite for me, I'll pass. But if they've been good people during Earth, their Earth period, they'll still go to the terrestrial kingdom. Okay, it's not bad. It's not so bad. And the third one is the uh, telestial kingdom, for the word te tele being far away. This is the one far away from God. That's where all the horrible people go. It's a bad place. <laughs> That's the bad place. But... According to Joseph Smith, if you would see how nice it is in the telestial kingdom, you'd kill yourself to get there. I understand. So it's always sold as being a wonderful place because God is merciful and good. So even the horrible people go to a place where it's so amazing you can't even imagine. Oh, interesting. Well, okay, so where the really bad people go? The worst sin you can com commit is direct testimony against God. So that's what you're doing right now, right? 
Well, Mormons would say, well, you don't really know. <laughs> Almost no one goes there. Okay. Uh, th that's where Satan goes. Interesting. So that's like also very different than like the, the hell versus heaven in Christianity. At first, that sounds very merciful and very right. nice. It yeah. does. Except the only place where you can be with your family and your spouse is in the celestial kingdom if you've been sealed in the temple. Ah. Which means if you want to be with your family after this life, you better do as we told. Yeah. Otherwise, you're going to the telestial where your family can't be or with the you. terrestrial or whatever it'll still be nice but you'll still be miserable but if your family goes to the terrestrial or the telestial as well why wouldn't they be with you i didn't say there were no gaps in this uh, story okay <laughs> they just isolate you somehow they're like they'll never meet yeah keep them away yeah. from each other they're in different okay. time zones and... well yeah if you're, if you're up high then you can visit down below sometimes that's that you can uh, do that you can move down but you can't move up interesting but there's a lot of holes in this theory because the idea is this is forever and you're pretending that people stagnate forever mm -hmm. which is it doesn't work like on a if, if you think about like with anything in religion almost if you think about it too hard it doesn't work yeah yeah and this is very detailed system to come out of you said it was based on one passage where like say that again something about the sun and the moon yeah paul speaks about there being uh different degrees of glory one being the sun, okay. one being the moon, and one being like the stars. Okay. Uh, but of course, this is Mormonism. So there's additional. Oh, there's the revelation. Right. There's okay. the, the book right. of Doctrine and Covenant, which is in, uh, uh, mostly quotes of revelations by Joseph Smith. Uh, and there's there's like a whole section, like a whole big chapter devoted to this, like this whole idea. Of the afterlife and, and tears of the afterlife. And yeah. Interesting. Uh, at one point, it was even believed that if you wanted to achieve the highest degree of glory, you not only have to be married you had to have multiple spouses mm, right polygamy very much polygamy so yeah i want to dig into this a little bit so the polygamy thing the what i was told was oh the the polygamy is for you to populate your own planet after you die and that's the reason that the prophets and that's why polygamy was part of the thing is that what polygamy was about theologically no. or was it just was it something else uh th <laughs> there's not much of a basis theologically <laughs> they just wanted to have multiple spouses other though. than the quotes of joseph smith who was yeah. not a very good person like if you go into the bible the only basis for it is king david and king solomon and uh, that's, yes. it. Okay. that's it there's, right. yeah. there's not much else um but of course joseph smith did some things and said some things about this that that are basically scripture like joseph smith is the holiest person you can find in mormonism to the point where he even said about himself no where it is said about himself some another prophet said about him that he did more for humankind than any other man save jesus christ wow and joseph smith would have won up that a little bit because he was that kind of person <laughs> there's a quote by joseph smith where he said that he's even done more for humankind than jesus christ okay he's humble yeah uh, no <laughs> <laughs> at, at one point, he had himself uh, uh, ordained king of the world. Okay, how do we? So he was, how no, do we do he's that? not a humble person. So, so he believed in, or he advocated polygamy. Or polygamy or polygamy is having multiple spouses and polygamy is having multiple wives, right? Polygamy is having multiple wives and polyandry oh, I... is having multiple husbands. Oh, okay. And both are pol polygamy. No, wait, now I'm messing wait. No, yeah, <laughs> no, that, think... yeah, that, no, that is what it is. Polyandry is having multiple husbands. Okay. If I'm if I'm not mistaken. But uh, women... he did he did both, actually. He was part of both. He had multiple husbands? No, but the women he married <laughs> had another husband when he married. Oh, them. okay. Right. Often without their husband knowing. Right. Yeah, they talk okay. About this a lot in that under the banner of heaven where they talk about yeah a bit how that how that works like because they're like oh well this person is married to this person but the prophet has decided he wants your wife yep and so you guys can stay married but she's also married to the prophet now yeah there's there's a historical uh, uh, instances of that happening in the church yeah but currently the main branch of Mormonism which is the LDS one right they don't practice polygamy no well no and yes. No and yes. <laughs> uh, they don't practice polygamy with the living. Okay. But the current prophet is sealed to multiple women. It's just that his first wife has already died. But according to Mormon theology, they're still married. She's still alive somewhere. Oh, okay. He's still her husband. Hmm. So they, uh, they comply with the laws here yeah. by not doing physical polygamy right now. Right. 
but as soon as someone dies, you can take another wife. That's fine. You can okay. be sealed to her. Yeah. On the other hand, uh, Susie, if you were to be married in the Mormon church and your husband died, you couldn't be sealed to also another man. It's a one-way street. Yeah. So if my husband dies, I can't get married to anyone else? Not in the church. Okay. For civil marriage, sure. But it wouldn't be sealed in the temple. And on an eternal scale, it wouldn't count. Okay. That's perfect. That's fine. <laughs> I'm fine with that. Yeah. So, and there's also a problem. Like, I think this was also in that fundamentalist sect where a lot of the wives were way, way underage. Oh, yes. That's not a current thing. Yeah. That This was in the 1800s, I think. Yeah, yeah. Is this one of the factors that led to such a big growth of Mormonism? The men had multiple wives and could procreate no, a lot? Or maybe. Just like the children that they would bring up and indoctrinate, and then those children would have children. And Well, it's part of it. Mormon families are large. Yeah. Like, in general, they're big. Uh, my brother is married to a girl who has nine siblings. Wow. My Yowzers. father has eight siblings. Jeez. Uh, well, I have five kids, which yeah. is for European standards is insane. When I, <laughs> when I tell people I have five kids, they're like, for real? <laughs> like, yeah, I had to buy a bigger car because Mormon families are big because we're taught that there's a lot of spirits waiting in the pre-mortal existence and they need good families. Oh, like pre-Earth. Yes. Phil, this is what we were talking about in that other episode with like people just hanging out in heaven, trying uh, like waiting right. to get a body. Yep. So you're saying there's people hanging out that need bodies, they need vessels? That's a core Mormon belief. Wow. Uh, you, uh, you know the passage in, in uh, I think it's Revelations, where it speaks about uh, Satan being cast out from heaven? Yeah. That's a core Mormon story. Yeah. Uh, according to Mormon theology, before our time on earth, we were all together with God and with Jesus in the pre-mortal existence. And there was a big meeting where God announced his plan and said, well, we I have this plan for everyone to become like me, like I am right now, like your father. And you all want to be like me, right? Yes, everyone wants to be like him. <laughs> uh, and so we need a plan. But for this plan, we need a redeemer. So who's willing to be the redeemer? And the first one that stood up, according to Mormon theology, was Satan, then called Lucifer. Uh, uh, morning star, I think it means. Yeah. And he said, well, I'm willing to do this and I'll make sure that they all come back to you. Like none of them will fall by the way and they won't have a choice but to follow my instruction. And God said, all right, is there anyone else? And Jesus <laughs> stepped forward and said, oh, I'll do it, but I'll give you the glory, Father. And Lucifer wanted the glory for himself. And because mm -hmm. of this, there was a war in heaven. Mm -hmm. And one third of all of the hosts of heaven were cast out uh, along with Lucifer, and they'll never get a body. Uh, but all the other people, which is us, were faithful people and were sent to earth to have this trial period on earth. And we've all all existed since like the beginning of time. But well, yeah, well, time is not a factor for God. So, right, if, right. If, who knows yeah. since when? Yeah. So, we're <laughs> co eternal with God. Interesting. Yeah. But according to, like, if, if you get really deep into Mormon theology, uh, it's an eternal process. God was a person like we are, who through his own personal growth process became a God. Uh, we can become gods like God is a God right now and mm. create our own creation. And that's kind of the ultimate goal, right? Yeah. And the, the idea of like creating your own planet is like a very simplified version of this because it's not about planets. It's right. it's about becoming a god. Right. And uh, like the church doesn't like to talk about this because it scares away the Christians. Mm. <laughs> and anyone who thinks normally. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, here's, here's the thing. If you believe in a god, what's a god? It's a very abstract concept. Yeah. It just means someone with way more power than you do. Mm -hmm. So if you believe your soul is eternal and your like whole life and your process and, and everything in existence is an eternal thing, why couldn't you become a god given enough time? So Alex and I met on Reddit in a yo-yo group, right? Because we're both <laughs> grown-ass men who play with toys. But when we first started talking about you being a Mormon and me being a, a, a Christian, and we both kind of left, and we started talking about it, and I think you listened to a couple episodes of the podcast, and you were like, oh shit, there's so many similarities <laughs> between Christianity yeah. and Mormons. What are some of those similarities, and then what are some of the differences, and how did those things kind of play into your journey of like walking away from Mormonism? We haven't got to your walk away part yet, but yeah, we'll get to that. Was that any part of the thing when you looked at other religions and saw the similarities? I think most of that came later. 
Okay. One of the similarities I had is you spoke about a couple of times. You talked about um, I'm trying to think of the term you used, like when all the Christians are taken away all of a sudden. The rapture. The, the rapture. Yeah. <laughs> the rapture. Uh, when you talked about the rapture and about being worried about the rapture, the idea of not being good enough ever was a constant in my life. Mm-hmm. Uh, and not because I was worried about the rapture, because according to Mormon theology, judgment happens after you die, but uh, and not like when everyone's suddenly taken away. Uh, but but the like Mormon theology, like I said, it's very much based on works as well as grace. Mm-hmm. You have to do works to earn grace, basically. And yes, Jesus is a loving taskmaster, but you still have <laughs> to give everything that you can and do everything you can. Do your very, very best. And in the back of my head, it was always, is this the best I can do? Right. I could have maybe done more. Mm-hmm. Uh, and this was a constant worry for me, a, a constant like being knowing there's like these tiny things that are I'm not perfect at, which means I might not be doing my very best. Right. I heard you speak about that even from like a young age. And I was like, oh, my word, that's like <laughs> <laughs> the terms are different, but the yeah. idea is very much the same. It's a constant worry that you won't be good enough mm-hmm. because you're constantly being judged. Everything you say, do, and even think uh, is judged. And and that was quite a heavy factor in uh, what made it hard for me to be religious in that way. I think it's illogical to talk about a best possible you, because like you said, there's always something you could do to change just a little bit to make yourself better. And every day you sit down and you're like, I could have done this one little thing differently and I would have been better. But you could say that on an infinite spectrum and you would yep. never get to your best possible self. So the whole idea of it is completely incoherent. Yeah, true. true. But it came from God, so it can't be wrong. <laughs> I know. Right. That's the conundrum. I, yeah. I didn't just have the Bible telling me that. I had multiple prophets throughout the past 250 years who told me the same thing. Yeah. Because the, the idea of revelation and divine inspiration in Mormonism is not limited to just feeling that God loves you. Every bishop believes that he has the right to revelation to govern his branch in the church. Every Mormon male has the, and and female as well, has the idea that they have the right to personal revelation to guide their lives. Uh, and most of the time, of course, the revelation is just confirming what the church already teaches. Mm-hmm. There's a, the the idea of uh, an emotionally heightened state that, that people can sometimes experience when they say, well, I feel the Holy Spirit. That is one of the biggest factors in the Mormon experience. Like from the very first time you meet the missionaries uh, and they teach you about the Mormon church, the first thing they teach you is, well, God loves us all and he wants to talk to us and he wants to help us. So, and the way he does this is through the Holy Ghost. And you read some scriptures about the Holy Ghost with them and you explain, you say, well, and here's what I think it's Peter said about the fruits of the Holy Ghost and peace, love, charity, kindness. Uh, and there's this whole list. I used to know mm. the scripture by heart in yeah. English and everything, but <laughs> yeah, <laughs> uh, humility, charity, humility, diligence. That's what yeah. it ends on. Uh, and here's the fruits of the Spirit. How is it? And, and here's the fruits of not being the spirit and there's a bunch of negative feelings and you say well which one what does that feel like well this feels good it's all right so when god wants to let you know that something's true you feel good right right how do you feel right now as we're talking to you we nice young men who <laughs> are using the best words we can and trying to make you feel important and dressed up nicely in a suit and tie and everything and now that we're talking to you about this wonderful story that we so strongly believe in that you can cl- see clearly see on our faces that we believe in how does that make you feel and they say well we feel good well that's that's the that's God. Tell you it's true. Oh, that's geez. so point. manipulative. All right, so here's the Book of Mormon, and we can do the same thing with the Book of Mormon. You read it, and then when you read it, you pray about it and ask if it's true or not, and, and God will make you feel uh, whether it's true or not. And, and you meet them the next t- time, a week later, maybe a couple of days later, whatever. How did you feel about the Book of Mormon when you prayed? Well, I didn't feel anything. Well, hang in there. God's not <laughs> telling you. Did you pray with honest intent? Well, I don't know if I did. Well, th- you've got to keep praying. Try it again. <laughs> uh, and so this is like this whole idea of a feeling confirming truth is one of the most core things in the Mormon religion. Oh, man, that's like it's like different and the same in Christianity, in evangelicalism. You know, like right. we're taught uh, your mm-hmm. feelings don't mean shit. Right. Because all your feelings are human. You have to rely on God. But then at the same time, your feelings are also right if, like you said, it's positive and good. When you're if in it worship, confirms God. Yeah, if it confirms your feelings about God, well, then that's God and your feelings are good. But if your feelings are ones of doubt or questioning, well, then those are from Satan because they don't confirm what God is. Well, that's similar because doubt and confusion are negative feelings. They hurt. Right. And you just say, well, that's God telling you it's not true. Right. But what if you feel good feelings about watching Jurassic Park? 
Ah, that's where it gets confusing, doesn't it? Yeah, you get good feelings from other sources. Are you supposed to think that T-Rex is God? One of my favorite films, ironically, and I didn't realize the connection until I'd gotten out of the church, is The Truman Show. I love that movie. (laughs) It's That film makes me cry every time. I know. And every time I'd be there like, oh, I'm feeling the spirit so strongly. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And it's ironically a man about, a, a, a film about a man who leaves behind everything he thought was reality. And right. he makes a large step to step into the unknown and give up everything. It's so ironic. I, yes. I don't even know. But yeah, that's where it gets confusing. But that, in a case like that, you just go, because this is what you do in religion. You have this theory already. You have this idea. And all you need to do is find facts to confirm it. So you right. go, well, there were some very important truths in the Truman Show. <laughs> so you go look for those truths. And you and say, those, well, God those are from God. Of those truths. That was the Holy Spirit right there. And it's interesting what you said about everyone in Mormonism having the right to personal revelation. But if your revelation conflicts with the prophet's revelation, well, then your revelation is wrong. Because clearly... Yeah. The prophet has the direct line. And while you have the right to res- revelation, your revelation better fall in line with the church line right. of revelation or your shit is wrong. <laughs> like, Well, it's a tiered system. So uh, the prophet is at the very tippy top. And if he says something, then that's a revelation for the whole world. Right. But you get to make re- uh, receive revelation for your personal life. So if you're looking for a new job and you have two different offers and you want to know which one you should take that's your that's your thing the prophet is not going to pray about you know it's not going to go and give revelation about which job you should take that's for uh, up to you to figure it out with god oh interesting but, but my revelation could not contradict the prophet's revelation so like no. my revelation couldn't say i can wear 10 earrings in my ear no 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 <laughs> No, no, that that's would not unfortunate. Work. Like I said, it's a downward thing mostly. Okay, got it. The shit rolls downhill. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So you are very recent escapee from the Mormonism yeah. uh, theology, Mormon theology. What were some of the like factors that that led to getting out? And we'll start there. But I've got we got a lot of questions from there. But during the year that we like got hit in the face with a truth brick is. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it was uh, church history and uh, doctrine and covenants studies. And at one point, my wife went, well, I always hear about Emma Smith, Joseph Smith's official first wife and only officially only only wife. Uh, I, we always hear that she was such a wonderful woman and so amazing, but I don't know any details. She's like, I don't know anything about this woman. All I know is she was supposed to be amazing. She was Joseph Smith's wife. I don't know anything. So she found in our bookshelf a book about uh, Emma Smith. And it was called Emma Smith, Mormon Enigma. Uh, and it's written by a historian who is a member of the church or was a member of the church, at least at the time that she wrote it. And she started reading this book. And at some point she would just come out and she, she'd read these passages to me. She said, well, I'm reading this thing about Joseph Smith. And, and I'd be like, all right, so tell me. And she would tell me the story of him finding one of his multiple wives, for instance, and how that went in his relationship with Emma Smith. And I would sit there listening to this going, that's not good. Like, he's just straight up lying to her. He's just deceiving her on all fronts, just not being an honest man. And more and more of these came. And at at one point I went, wait, why is he a prophet? Like, I'm a better man than that. Mm -hmm. I don't do that to my wife. Mm -hmm. Like, I actually respect my wife and I share things with her that I that I encounter and I talk to her about things. And why is he a prophet and I'm not? And at that point, I wasn't even saying he's not a prophet. I was like, if he's that bad and he gets revelation from God, where's mine? Yeah, right. <laughs> it's a great question. Because according to Mormon theology, I should be able to get every revelation I need as long as I'm being faithful, as long as I'm doing everything I need to do. I think I'm doing most of the things, although in the back of my mind, still this thing of not being good enough. But then mm-hmm. li- hearing all these things about Joe Smith, and they were big things. And I was just sitting to that listening and going, that's not right. Mm. Either I should be a prophet or he shouldn't be. But it, both of them can't work at the same time. Right. Huh. Uh, and from there on, we kind of like she finished the book and it gets into a whole like political squabble between who's Joseph Smith's uh, follower or who's who's the next prophet and mm-hmm. the political fight between her children and uh, Brigham Young's followers and the the split in the church that took place back then. And this is all stuff we had never heard before. And like I said, I had multiple years of institute, multiple years of church history seminary. I had read everything I thought there was to read. And there was all this stuff in there going. And I was going, what? <laughs> what is the story? realizing more and more that Brigham Young was also a piece of shit. (laughs) 
And it's like, well, if Joseph was a piece of shit and Brigham Young was a piece of shit, none of the ones after him could have been profitable. Right. And and so the whole thing just kind of fell apart. And from there on, we started digging and we found so much dirt. There is the the billion, do- billion dollar hoard, the buying shopping malls, the uh, blacks and the priesthood stories. I don't know if you know anything about mm. that. Uh, black people weren't allowed the priesthood until I think it was 1974 in the church. You didn't know that when you were a Mormon? I knew it. And at the same time, uh, this was one of those things where I was like, well, I don't have any way of reconciling that. So I can only trust that God knows what he's doing and that the prophet knew what he was doing. I'm not responsible for this bit. So I'm kind of have to put it aside for now and maybe ask God when I see him later. Okay. Mm. Uh, we have an analogy uh, in the ex-Mormon community. Uh, we say all those things that you can't recognize, you put them up on a shelf. Mm. You say, well, I can't, I can't reconcile this. I don't know what's going on here. It must be true. I just don't understand it yet. So I'm going to put it up on the shelf and uh, save it for later when I can actually find out the answer. Uh, But two and a half years ago, my shelf broke. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Too much stuff on it. Too much stuff on it. Yeah. Uh, The the ex-Mormon online community talks about shelves and people breaking their shelf. Hmm. And there's, if you go into the ex-Mormon subreddit, there's weekly people who go, well, my shelf just broke. Mm. (laughs) Yeah. Uh, And they're like, I don't know what to do. My entire life is gone. I've spent my entire life devoted to this thing that is just straight up bullshit. And I, like, I can't, I don't know. I don't know what's going on. Yeah. So going back to the billion dollar hoard, is that also (laughs) something that's not generally known in the actual active Mormon community? Most people don't know. That was mainstream news. Yeah. Well, that's mainstream news in the States. That's not necessarily mainstream news in Europe. Uh, Right. Okay. So you wouldn't have known about it, but Mormons in America should reasonably know about that if they're... I mean, in I mean, theory. Well, and maybe they just don't care. They're like, oh, good, my church has a that's lot of what money. That's I'm thinking. Yeah, and, they just but, don't care. Uh, it's, yeah. And and that's also, that's a shelf item. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> because we're also taught that the church does so much good in the world. Uh, the church likes to brag about how much they do. <laughs> like I said, I did translation for the church. And one of the articles I translated was the church bragging about how much they'd spent on COVID relief. And this was, I just found out about the board. Uh, and they were bragging about giving, I think it was $3 million on COVID relief. <laughs> and I was like, that's nothing. Right. That's that's less than a percent. What are we, mm-hmm. that's nothing. And then you get into the other reports that they do for charity work and for doing doing good works. And you find out that not only do they count the money that they give for that, but that they spend on that. They also count the man hours that the members put in. Right. <laughs> uh, and they count those at, I think it's like $50 an hour. Wow. And I was like, I gave a lot more to the church than I thought I did. That's, <laughs> yeah. That's right. right. And I gave a lot, I'll tell you. <laughs> so this is the kind of stuff that most members don't know. Yeah. You don't have time to follow mainstream news mostly. as a mo- You don't have time. I cannot overemphasize how much the church eats into your life. There is two hours on a Sunday. It used to be three hours, by the way. Church used to be three hours. Oof. That's just a Sunday. Then we have the ward meeting on usually a Tuesday. That's another three hours or so. The kids have activities on a Friday. Uh, that's another full evening. You're supposed to have family home evening for a full evening on a Monday. Uh, Wednesday, depending on whether you're in the stake committee or not, that's your that's another full evening. On Saturday, there's often Super Saturdays for institute and seminary. Thursday, a lot of institute class meet on a Thursday, Saturday, uh, oh, I already said Saturday, and then there's Sunday again. <laughs> Jeez. And every day you need to study, study your scriptures alone and as a family. Mm-hmm. This religion consumes your life. Mm-hmm. And if it's not, then you're not fully in. Okay. They take your money and they take your time. Do you remember any of the other shelf items before it broke? Oh, one, one of the big ones for me is the temple and temple work and work for the dead. Uh, there, there's a couple of things like uh, you might have seen Mormon temples around big, gaudy looking buildings. Yep. Most major American cities have at least one. And, yeah. and you're talking New York and Washington. And I mean, Phil and I grew up near the Washington. So. Oh, there you go. It's huge. When you go around that loop on 495. The, on the Beltway, boom, yeah. That yep. thing comes right up out of the freaking thing. It looks, looks like insane. a Disney looks castle. Looks like Disney World. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Looks like a Disney castle. Okay. 
in the temple, there's a bunch of covenants and rituals that you go through. So uh, it has a number of functions. Uh, you, you can do a bunch of work for the dead. I'll get into that in a second. But also things like marriages take place there. Sealings. They call them sealings because you, you can also get married at City Hall, but you can only get sealed in the temple. Okay. Uh, you can also get sealed to your children. So if, for instance, if you marry uh, someone new and they already have children, you can get those children sealed to you, to you and your wife, so that you'll still be a family after this life. Okay. Super. The holding your family hostage thing is a is a thing. Mormon silicone. Uh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> <silicone>. <laughs> But a, a large part of the temples is work for the dead. So the idea is everyone on earth uh, needs to hear the gospel and needs to make these covenants so they can reach the celestial kingdom later on. But not everyone has had a chance to do this in life. This is why Mormons are big on theology. You can't help someone if you don't know who they are. So you have to find out when they've been born, when they got married, when they died, so that you can do work for them in the temple. And in the temple, you can get baptized for them. You can receive an endowment, which is uh, a bunch of uh, covenants, promises that you make uh, with silly hats on. <laughs> the main problem I had was I was always taught Christ will come back at some point. Then the millennium starts. We'll have a thousand years in which everyone is resurrected and everyone can go and join the church or to sometimes maybe raise their uh, uh, prematurely died children. Or th there's all sorts of like wonderful things that happen in this millennium. Right. Why the fuck am I doing work for dead people? <laughs> they can all go do it themselves later. Why am I spending hours on hours on hours on this? First, I have to research the names and do all the genealogy. Then I have to drive up to the temple, which I don't live around the block from there. It's an hour and a half's drive for me. So when I go there, it's a full evening or a full day. It used to be in Frankfurt. We used to go for days. Jesus. I would go there. I would do all these baptisms for the dead, which can be fairly fast. You can do like 20 of them in like five minutes. That's not an issue. But then I have to do all the anoint or the individual endowments for them one at a time, because you can only do one for one person at a time. There's hundreds of thousands of these. We're spending so much time on this. And all these people will be resurrected later and they can go do it themselves. Why am I supposed to do this? Right. It never made sense to me. If there's a resurrection, if there's a thing, why are we doing all this work for dead people? It makes no sense. We're spending millions on Did it. Did you ever ask that question? I, I might have at some point in my teenage years, but I, like the answers were things like, well, we need to learn to love everyone and you can't love them if you don't know them. And if you work for them, then you get to know them and you start to love them. And I was like, sure, <laughs> I guess, but I could just meet them when they're resurrected. Yeah, so yeah, I, yeah. Right. Like, I, so I never understood this. This was like a, one of major things that always bugged me. This big item on my okay. little broken shelf. <laughs> and, and other than that, there weren't too many items on there. There were small ones like, oh, well, the black people in the priesthood was a thing. But but that mm -hmm. was a bit far away from my personal war world. Yeah. I don't know a lot of black people. I know a couple of them, but like not a lot of them. And I certainly don't know a lot of them in the church. Um, so that was sometimes I'd be like, I wonder what they think about this whole thing. But mm -hmm. it, and there was like small things like that. But like n most things didn't weigh too heavy for me because I was just like, well, I just got to be obedient and do my things and 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 make sure that I'm always good enough and just work on myself. Yeah. Right. Because of all possible outcomes, you never imagined it was an option for you to just let it all no. go, right? Yeah. No. So you had to find a way to make it work yeah. until you couldn't, until the shelf broke. What was the last thing on the shelf that basically brought it down? Joseph Smith. The, the profit thing. Yeah. Yeah, the profit thing. Because okay. it was a logical conclusion thing. The thing is, within Mormonism, there's a lot of tearing down other religions. We're fairly good at it. We've gotten to the point where almost any religion, you can look at them and go, well, that's an inconsistency and that's weird and that makes mm. no sense. And mm -hmm. I've been on a mission. I did this for two years. I mm -hmm. like two years. I spent all my time trying to think of ways to get people to join us. That's a power that can be turned the other way. Mm -hmm. And so when that finally happened, we were like, just like, oh, that's bullshit. That's bullshit. That's nonsense. That's crap. <laughs> oh, that makes no sense. Get that out of the window. And the whole thing just fell over just one by one. You're talking about these rituals and the ceremonies in the temple. In I, I hate to keep referencing just this one show because it's like the most recent thing that I've yeah. <laughs> looked with with Mormonism. But there was like the back room, which was like almost like in the Jewish temple. It was like the Holy of Holies. But yep. like in the Mormon thing, it was this room that basically had a bed on it, which is where the prophet or somebody could do some kind of things to 
right. various women. That's a, that's a fundamentalist thing. That's a real thing in the temples, like that room, yeah. that Holy of Holies room. And people would stand around and watch whatever was happening on this altar. Right. And it was real disturbing. That that sounds more of a fundamentalist thing. That that's not something that happens in the mainstream. The mainstream, temples. yeah, interesting. There's there's initiatory uh, rituals, which is washings and anointings, uh, which also used to be naked, by the way. Oh, that's fun. Like, uh, and when I did it, it was almost naked. You get like a poncho and nothing <laughs> else. Uh, those are done separately by men and women. Luckily, uh, wow. So there's like a women's wing and there's a man's wing, and 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 you uh, get a holy poncho. Yeah, uh, well, now it's a holy poncho or it used to be a holy poncho and they would call it a shield uh now those are also not naked anymore and people you tell that it used to be naked don't believe you because mm -hmm. it's all very gaslighty and like no we've always been at war with eurasia right <laughs> yeah that's crazy uh but there's a bunch of like rituals it's if you go in with the mindset oh this is all religion it's all symbolic then you're fine with it but if you don't know up ahead what's coming and there's a lot of people who really freak out their first time in the temple because mm -hmm. they're like well i've been to all these mormon corporate things and everyone wears suits and everyone seems so presentable mm -hmm. and then you get there and it's weird outfits and yeah. hand signals and <laughs> weird promises oh the hand signals are really weird the hand signals are worse if you know what they mean. Oh, yeah. I didn't know. Wait, what hand signals? I don't understand. Well, uh, Joseph Smith was a Freemason at one point. He just straight up copied the large part of the uh, Freemason initial initiatory uh, uh, ritual. And so there's a bunch of hand signals, you, like the ways you hold your hand. And But as long as I had been going to the temple and i the first time i went i was like 19 18 19 my parents always told me you know everything in the temple is spiritual everything has a meaning everything you need to constantly sit there and think about what does this mean and what's this mean in my life and a lot of things so i didn't know what they meant so there's four sets of hand signals uh just you stand up and you do like an oath type deal and you hold your hands in a certain way palm up or palm down hand out hand back uh, but all my time there, a large part of it was just trying to think of what do these things mean? Because they're supposed to be all spiritual and supposed to learn things. So I would sit there and come up with ways that they would translate to my religious experience. And there's one, for instance, where the, you, one hand is held palm up and the other is held palm down. And I figured well, this obviously this must mean that I receive blessings from God or something and I'm supposed to pass them down to other people that I can. So I would sit there and try to come up with things that these things meant. And then after we'd been out for about half a year, I found out what they really meant and what they used to mean. Because uh, my parents and everyone who'd been going to the temple before 1990 actually got explanation. Uh, it turns out they're all suicide symbols. So one means if I talk about what happens here in the temple, I'll, I'll slit my throat. Right. Oh. And the other means if I talk about what's in the temple, I'll rip out my tongue and kill myself some other way. And then there's another that's the one with the palm up, palm down. The palm down hand is a razor that cuts your bowels. And the other <gasps> hand is to catch your bowels as you're cutting them out. Oh, joyous. This is the one thing that I am angry about with my parents. I, everything else, they they really tried hard. They, <laughs> they, they did the best they could with the means they had, with the resources they had, with what they thought to be true. I don't blame them anything. But this one thing I feel deceived about. Because they knew. Yeah. They knew what it meant and they never told you. They knew what it meant and they would never tell me. It kind of makes sense because they had promised these things. Right. You can't talk about them. So you're saying any member before 1990 knew what these things meant, but they were kind of sworn to secrecy about it and wouldn't tell anybody else. And so anybody, any new members since then or children born, they see these hand signals, but they don't know what they mean. And pretty soon nobody's going to know what they mean. And if you tell them, they often don't believe you. This is and nuts. every member before, I think it's 1990, it might have been like 89. Every member before that who has gone through an endowment session, as they call it, has made these suicide pacts. Jeez. All of them. And it's if you talk about what happens in the temple then suicide that's one of the things you promise not to do that's wild shit And so you and your wife did this kind of concurrently. She was the one that kind of got drawn in with the Emma Smith thing. And then she brought it to you and you guys kind of both started digging or was it, yeah. was it a little bit separated? 
No, it was. Uh, we've always communicated a lot about what we do in the church, and when it comes to faith and and studies, she found some things, and she's like, "Well, what's your take on this?" And, and we'd look at it together and go, "Well, well that's not good." Um, <laughs> right? Yeah. She didn't bring it to you as like, uh, "This is going to blow your mind, and we're going to leave." It was like, "This no, is no, no. thing I found." Yeah. What do you What do you think about it? Yeah. Yeah. No, we were both in one hundred percent. Yeah. The idea that we were going to leave was unthinkable. The the closest we ever got was we were listening to a podcast about, um, I can't think of what it's called now, the man's name is Rudolf Steiner. And he was a man who believed that he could look into a spiritual library and um, uh, delve into every imaginable book ever written or ever will be written. It's kind of like a clairvoyant type. Occultist. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's like a spiritualism type deal. He actually organized like a school system and our kids were in that school system. And I listened to a podcast about him and I told her about this. I told her, well, there's this guy and he he put up the school where our children are at, and he believes that there's this spiritual library where he can access any book he wants ever written or ever will be written. Right? And she went, all right, so wait, <laughs> so how's that different from Joseph Smith? Uh, and that's yeah. a couple of years before we actually left, but we both went, huh. huh. Yeah. And up until that point, we had never even considered the idea that it might not be true. Yeah. Because we were always working backward. It was always, well, fact one, church is true. Now we got to fit all these things in with right. that big fact. Right. Confirmation bias. Yeah, very much so. Yeah. So how did leaving, how did that affect your immediate family with your kids? And then did your did you tell your parents about this? Or like, how, how did that go? How did it affect your familial relationships? I was interesting. Um, my father-in-law is the bishop in our ward. Yikes. And I figured, well, he's the spiritual leader. I got to tell him. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, and so I told him, I said, well, I don't think I believe the church is true anymore. And uh, I said, and I can't, I can't participate in it. I said, there's a whole bunch of reasons. I don't think we want to list them all right now. It's a bit much, but I, I can't. Uh, and I said, and I, I told him, and I said, if I have and, and if Jesus is the person that I always thought he was, he would have more understanding for me leaving with integrity and being wrong than he would for me staying despite thinking it was wrong. Mm. I love that. That is really good. Quotable. Because if, <laughs> if there was a Jesus and he was the type of person he was, he would rather me leave and be wrong about it. Yeah. Um, and he was like, well, I don't know if I agree about that. And it's like, that's <laughs> fine. You don't have to. That's the way things are. Uh, mm -hmm. And a, like a week and a half later, my parents invited me for lunch just me uh, because they said well we think some things are not going well and they asked me you know what's going on we feel like things are going on and what's going on and can you tell us about it and i uh, I, I talked to them about it um and they very much tried to be very understanding uh i have been lucky enough to have like i said i don't blame them for anything they've ever done mm -hmm. in my childhood or raising me they really did do the best they could uh and they still do they try to be understanding uh but they're obviously not happy about it uh luckily we're all still in touch. My parents live about half an hour away from here. Uh, we see them on a not so regular basis anymore because they used to be in the same, same church uh, uh, ward. Uh, but they've been kind and, you know, trying to navigate this thing that's also new for them. Yeah. I was expecting you to say that you were shunned. It happens. Uh, especially in Utah, it happens a lot. Mm -hmm. But we grew up surrounded by Gentiles. <laughs> okay. By yeah. heathens. Uh, so it, we're used to not being in that direct surrounding. Right. Do you think you would ever get to the point of saying to your parents like, hey, if you really believed this stuff the way you raised me and the way you believe it, and I walked away from it believing it wasn't true, if you're going to be true to what the Mormon religion teaches, then shouldn't you be more upset and shouldn't you be more passionate about trying to get me back? Like, this is one of the arguments I always say with like with a lot of Christians. It's like, well, if you really believed down to your depths of your soul that I'm going to go to hell and yeah. shouldn't you be dedicating your whole life to making sure as a person that you love that you're going to do everything possible to keep me from going to hell. Like my parents, yeah. I told them and they were like, we don't get it. We think you're wrong, but we still love you, blah, blah, blah. But yeah. not and not a day since have they ever tried to challenge it. They've never tried to ask why, you know, they haven't even tried. And I'm like, you've been doing this for 50 years and you're not even trying to keep your own son. <laughs> like you, mm -hmm. you either to me. Yeah. And a, and a logical thing that says, well, you really don't believe it or I'm not worth it. 
I've seen this both ways. Like I've seen ex-Christians bemoan the fact that their Christian friends won't leave them alone. And you know, they're just throwing apologetics at them and trying to get them back. And they hate that. And then on the other side, I see what you're saying, Phil, is that they're not trying to get me back. And so no matter which way they go, like, I feel like we're mad about it. Oh, it's a catch 22. Actually, yeah. I wouldn't say I'm mad about it. I yeah. don't want I don't want them trying because I, I appreciate that they respect my decision. But if in my opinion, deep inside how they should feel is they should be agonizing every se- I shouldn't see them post on Facebook about fucking flowers or about wow. their garden right, or right. about their other kids who are mm-hmm. living God's life. Their whole life should be consumed with I've got an apostate worry. son who's should going to hell. Worry. Right. Yeah. But you know, I can text some pictures of my freaking raised beds and they're like, oh that's nice. Uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> you know? I, I get that. I get that, but Mormonism has an out because they very much take the long view. Uh, because uh, after this life, there's still the afterlife. Where okay. They can still try to convert me, where I'll be confronted with the harsh realities of being wrong. Then there's the uh, the millennium, which is another thousand years of me being confronted. Why they're on? They're not like they don't have to be too worried. They have a theological right. out. Mm. Okay. And uh, and um, also the idea where. It, like I said earlier, Mormon hell is not that harshly defined. Yeah, mm-hmm. that's the worst. I mean, it's like kind of like like the bad place in the show, the good place. Yeah, it's yeah. like actually looks kind of fun. Yeah, it's not too bad. Right. Uh, uh, and um, so there's there's a lot of that. Uh, but I also get what you're saying, uh, Phil, because when we were active, we were constantly working on what we called non-active or inactive members. Mm-hmm. How are we going to get them back? And we'd send people by and they'd visit <laughs> them and bring them a plate of cookies or we'd send the missionaries or stuff like that. Mm. They never did that to us. Really? And like, I get it. At the at, On the one hand, they shouldn't be worried. But on the other hand, you feel like they should make more of an argument. We're going to play a little game called, is it really Mormon? All right. I feel like Susie, you got to find some game show music to play behind this. Okay. We do it. <laughs> Will do. Come on down. Is this really Mormon? Adam and Eve were in the United States and go. Yes, definitely true. Uh, please explain. Because <laughs> I will. What the fuck? <laughs> Joseph Smith said they were in Missouri. That's the whole source. That's all. That's it. Joseph Smith said That's it, it, so it was true. Uh, Joseph Smith pronounced that that was where the Garden of Eden was. That is where Adam and Eve lived. The place was called Adam on Diamond, and Adam had a huge meeting with all of his <laughs> posterity there, all of his descendants. That's where he gave them his priesthood bled- blessings and his fatherly blessings, and um, he built an altar there, and at one point, I think he even picked up a stone and said this was part of the altar that Adam built. And do Mormons currently believe this? Yes. Really? How? It's never been disproven or or stated otherwise by any prophet afterwards. I mean, I guess it's not that far fetched to believe because, like, I mean, current American Christians don't have any basis to believe or think where Adam and Eve were in Mesopotamia. Like, they just say, "Well, the Bible said so." That's true. So it's not really any different. Like Joseph Smith said so, and. Well, Mormons make up like some try to do some apologetics for this and they try to make up ways and so they involve things like Pangea and try to pull it back to when all the continents were still one big continent. Okay. Honestly, it makes no sense. That that was (laughs) millions of years ago. Right, and it makes about as much sense as uh, speaking about how the continents were moved during the flood. It's it's complete other bollocks. It's just (laughs) nonsense. Okay, I have another one. God was a man on another planet before being exalted to a God. Yeah, Joseph Smith stated that as man is, God once was, and as God is, man can once be. Okay. Uh, so wow. he, that's And that's one of the bigger things in Mormonism is that we can become gods like God is. And hmm. if we can become gods from being men and women, then obviously God must have been able to become a god from being a man himself. I didn't know that because I thought, yeah, that men can become gods, but I thought God was always a god, considering he created everything from existing matter, right? So how could he be a man on another planet before he created matter? Right? They yeah. think the matter was there first, right? Yes. So he didn't yeah. create it from nothing. This is one of those paradoxes that makes no sense within Mm -hmm. uh, anything we know about physics. Yeah. 
and <laughs> and at that point you go well god is obviously uh, omnipotent and so he it can move outside of time and space and dimension as well mm. so i don't have an answer for this but it, there must have been something put it on the shelf, yeah, shelf. <laughs> what about this one that jesus touched rocks and he made them glow forever and then they put him on the front of ships to sail to america that's in the book of mormon <laughs> And I thought this was so crazy. I was like, how can anybody believe this? But then I realized, oh, Christians believe that Jonah got swallowed by a whale, that Moses right. part of the Red Sea. Like, it's no different. The story is no different from any of the other biblical stories. No. The story is there was a group of people from the time, a time of Babel who left before the languages got mixed okay. up. And they built ships. And at one point, one of them came to God and said, well, we have a problem because we built these ships and they're all waterproof. But it's really dark inside. <laughs> Uh, and and we had to cross an ocean and that's not really fun uh and so god said well you come up with an answer and the guy went back and melted some rocks or some crystals or we we don't know exactly yeah and he presented these to god and he said to god well i know i have so much i believe in you as a as a deity if you touch these stones they will glow and god went well you have great faith so i'll touch the stones and so he touched the stones and uh the the prophet saw his finger and went i saw your finger and i didn't know god was had a finger like a man and so he falls down and god goes well did you see my finger? Yes. Do you have enough faith to see more? Yes, I do. And then he showed him, him whole, himself to this person who is in the Book of Mormon, only called the brother of Jared. The brother. <laughs> wow. Okay. He doesn't even get his own name. He is never named. And the rocks are still around somewhere glowing, presumably. We have never found the rocks. But no. they have to be out there somewhere. We don't know. They, they are divine rocks. So I'd, I, I'm assuming, I'm only assuming that's an eternal battery. Yeah, yeah, exactly. All right, here's another one. Mormons don't believe in military service, national anthems, or voting. That's not true. You are correct. That is not true. Do you know who that is? What no, religion is that? That's Seventh-day Adventist, right? That is Seventh-day no. Adventist. No, 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 well, no, no. No, I don't think so. My sister service. votes. Oh, yeah, they, they do the national anthem and everything. This is Jehovah's Witness. Oh, Jehovah's Witness, Witness. yeah. Yeah, Yeah, because they don't believe in birthdays or holidays either. Yeah, Yeah, they are draft dodgers, but uh, Mormons are fully active in the military. A couple of prophets served in World War II. Okay. Do you have any good ones you want to tell us that would be just like good mind blowers? Oh, this is a fun one. Uh, Joseph Smith proclaimed that there are men and women living on the moon and on the sun. Wow. And they and they are I think it's eight feet tall and dress like Quakers. They're eight oh, feet yeah. tall. They're human, but they're eight feet tall. Yeah, and they dress like Quakers. Well, everybody knows that like Quaker dress is perfect for the surface of the sun. Clearly. I mean, that makes perfect sense. But that's that's what like I didn't find that out until I left and I was like, What? Yeah, they <laughs> probably don't what? teach you that at Temple. Yeah, they're not no, teaching you that one because you, you'd, you'd immediately anyway. be like, what the fuck? Like, yeah, it's like we sent people to the moon. There were no people there. Right. <laughs> but you're on the wrong side. Right. Possibly. Right. Uh, maybe they were on the other side. I, yeah, I the dark side. So you mentioned you have five kids. I don't know their ages, but I'm assuming that you indoctrinated them into Mormonism. Oh, yeah. And how have well, they been tried. coping? <laughs> you tried. Uh, it didn't take? What does that mean? <laughs> our eldest one went, when we finally said we left the church, he went, well, I believe in science anyway, so. <laughs> oh, wow. Good. And we're That's like, awesome. what the, f- kid? You- <laughs> Damn it. <laughs> we got you the priesthood and everything. What? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and, and, but he, he's a, he's slightly autistic, but he's super interested in anything science. And so when we finally put our kids down and we said, well, we know you've been seeing us have these discussions because we didn't try to hide anything Mm -hmm. from our kids. We just did it openly. We didn't always include them, but we said, we, you've seen us have these discussions. We don't think we believe in any of this anymore. And he went, well, I never really believed in it anyway. (laughs) <laughs> and our second one who was then i think 11 she went oh thank goodness now i can be myself oh uh, that's heartbreaking and we felt so bad and uh the one after that was close to uh, a similar reaction but less intense she's like well okay but i didn't i thought i thought it was boring anyway so mm-hmm. uh but yeah the, our second that was that hurt yeah, yeah. Uh, but we're all good now and she's really excited she's all like super lgbtq pro and she's very excited about that uh she's trying to figure out who she is mm-hmm. uh, and we're like oh that's fine that's great do, though do whatever yeah. you want and she's yeah. like well i don't think i ever want kids and we're like all right yeah and if we were still uh super into all of this then we that would have hurt but yeah we're like mm-hmm. well that's fine yeah 
Well, that's. And what that's about crazy. the youngest two? The youngest two, uh, the youngest, the uh, second one, uh, second youngest is now nine, almost nine. Uh, she was too young to pick up any of this. Okay. She used to go to church and then sit in the in the kids' room, and because she didn't like the classes, so she would go <laughs> play with the little kids. Uh, and our she very didn't. youngest is only turning four in the, this month. Okay. So she was too young to get any of it anyway. Stepping outside of your bubble, you learn a lot. Yeah. Things they don't want you well, to know. Well, and the first thing you need to be able to work into your brain is just the idea, I might have been wrong about this. Mm-hmm. Right. You don't even have to say, you know, something's wrong about that. You don't have to say this is all wrong. Just entertaining the idea that you might be wrong. Yeah. Because up until that time, it was all confirmation bias and it was all finding reasons for why it wasn't wrong. Yeah. Yeah. You said a couple of things that have rung true with a lot of the stories that we've heard from people and a lot of our own stories. And the first thing that I remember is when you were telling your father-in-law that you didn't believe, you said you can't. And I think that is the operational word for a lot of people who are going through any kind of deconversion. It's not that you didn't want to. Oh, I desperately wanted to. Right. You desperately wanted to. It was like, you, I literally cannot believe this anymore. And I think this kind of was something a previous guest of ours said, it's like, when you're talking to your family about this, one of the best ways to share it is say, look, in the same way that you, Christian mom and dad, can't believe in Allah as God, I can't believe in Jesus as God or whatever. You know, So that is like a big thing, a big, I don't know, it's like a thread that runs through everybody's deconversion story. And then what you just said there at the end is like a really fitting way, I think, to like wrap up saying, like, just be willing to entertain the idea that what you've believed, and this would be true even for us on the other side, I'm open to being proven wrong. And if you're in any kind of belief system or any kind of system, and you're not willing to entertain the idea that, okay, I could be wrong, then you're in a place that is not mentally, logically healthy, because you have to be able to say, well, maybe I got this wrong let's look at the evidence. Yeah, that was the first thing. And that that was the main thing. It was just entertaining the idea that maybe I shouldn't be working backwards. <laughs> maybe I yeah. should take what, the, what I know and then see what conclusions come from that instead of doing this whole thing where I already say I know what I know. Uh, and the ironic thing is someone told, like when they found out I left, someone told me and they said, well, I hope that you'll always be open uh, for uh, for anything. I was like, mom, this is the first time I'm really open. Yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> this is the first time I'm actually entertaining the idea that I don't know what I think I know. Right. And it it broke me. Uh, it was devastating for a long time. Like I said, this was like Mormonism dominated my life and had done for so for the past 40 years. Everything was about the church. Like I have some friends outside of the church, but my main ones were in the church. All my experiences were in the church. My summers were in the church. My weekends were often in the church. Everything was in the church. Right. And then the first time that I, that we, as a couple, we entertained the idea, well, what if we're wrong? Because if we look at this and we look at this logically and we actually uh, take a moment to say, well, we now know these things that we didn't know before. What does this mean? And the whole thing toppled over just piece by piece. It was like a domino thing. The first few things went and the others just all followed. This might be the record. Is this our longest one? I think so. There's no way you're editing this one down to an hour. So good luck with that. uh, Yeah, Yeah, but uh, that's cool. I mean, I think it's it was a really good, fascinating conversation. I mean, I think we learned a lot, like just in general about Mormonism and just what that process is like. But then also seeing the similarities, you know, for your journey to our journeys. And yeah, so hopefully that resonates with a lot of people. And yeah, the details are slightly different every now and then. Um, But the sentiment in general, I feel is very much the same, which is why like hearing you guys talk to other people uh, resonated a lot. Yeah. Well, this was a, a fantastic overview of Mormonism. I feel like I just sat through a college 101, like Mormon 101 <laughs> class. I took notes and everything. This is yeah. so interesting and fantastic. And I hope our listeners get as much out of it as I did. Yeah. Well, if you want to know more, let me know. And I'll be happy to send you some sources and things. Awesome. Oh, sweet. If for anyone uh, uh, listening to this who is either active or getting out, I would highly recommend a, a site called A Letter to My Wife, which is a, a man who wrote a letter to his wife and broke down one by one 
all sorts of things that he was having trouble with. And it includes things like polygamy, and it includes all sorts of things uh, with sources. And uh, it's fairly easily readable. All right. Well, thanks, Alex. We appreciate all your time. And we'll, I'm sure we'll be talking to you again. Yeah. Thanks, guys. I enjoyed it a lot. Thank you. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Flawed Theology Podcast. I'm Phil. And I'm Susie. Tune in next time where we will continue to tackle the question, if your theology were wrong, wouldn't you want to know? Be sure to join us on our Facebook group, Dangerous Questions, and follow us at flawedtheologypodcast.com. Subscribe wherever you listen to your favorite podcasts. Rate and review the podcast on Google, Spotify, Apple. Those uh, reviews are really cool and we like to hear from them. So until next time, keep asking the dangerous questions. See you next time. Is the biking a requirement? Because I see a lot of Mormons are always on bikes. Okay, that's interesting. Well, it it depends on where you're at. It it depends on where you're at. Uh, I served, I worked in Scotland, no bikes. Oh. Uh, The hills suck. You don't want to do bikes. Oh, yeah, right. You got to have like a geared bike, otherwise (laughs) you're not getting anywhere. walking or buses or nothing else. Uh, But over here in the Netherlands, we're one of the most bicycle friendly countries in the world. No one, everyone bikes here. The only weird thing about missionaries being on bikes here is that they wear helmets because no one here wears a helmet on the bike. (laughs) Like you can pick them out from a distance. Oh, there! Look, there's a pair of people wearing bicycle helmets. They must be missionaries. And that's funny because they 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 should have God's protection, but yet they're yeah. the ones wearing helmets. Yeah, yep. it's one of those inconsistencies. There's yeah. tons of them. A letter to my wife is is very interesting. If you ever want to know, like more than what the Mormons sell you. And yeah. That's a good place to look at. I might just share that on my Facebook so that my dentist friend can see it. <laughs> yeah. Would that be stirring the pot too much? <laughs> Maybe. Sometimes you got to stir the pot. Besides. I don't know. I saw one of those letters years before I left the church and it didn't like harm my belief system. Really? Okay. Mm. Yeah. Uh, I went through a lot of it and then I went, well, I wonder if there's a rebuttal to this. And I found a rebuttal. There's always a rebuttal. And then I found a rebuttal to the rebuttal and another rebuttal yeah. to that. And I was like, ah, oh, well, this is above <laughs> my pay grade. I'm not getting this. Yeah. Put it on the shelf. Put it on the shelf. <laughs>